Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17, and you can find that in your pew Bibles in the New Testament on page 172, and then our second reading is one page right after that. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. All right, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And then flipping the page over to Corinthians 11, 23 and 26, this is the Apostle Paul talking about how he has received and passes on the tradition of the Last Supper. He says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Several centuries ago, the Pope in Rome decreed that all the Jewish people in Italy had to either convert to Christianity or else leave the country. There was understandably an outcry from the Jewish community, and so in order to maintain the peace, the Pope offered this deal. He would have a religious debate with the leader of the Jewish community. And if the Jews won the debate, they could stay in Italy. If the Pope won, then they would have to either convert or leave. Well, the Jewish people picked a wise, aged rabbi to represent them in this debate. However, the rabbi did not speak Italian. And since the Pope did not speak Hebrew, they both agreed that it would be a silent debate. So on the day chosen, the Pope and the rabbi sat down opposite from each other in front of all the people, and the Pope began the debate by raising three fingers high into the air. The rabbi simply looked back and raised one finger. Next, the Pope waved his finger around his head, while the rabbi pointed to the ground where he sat. The Pope then brought out the communion bread and a chalice of wine, but the rabbi pulled out an apple. With that, the Pope sighed, stood up, and declared that he was beaten. The rabbi was just too clever, and so the Jews could stay in Italy. Later on that day, the cardinals met with the Pope, and they asked him what happened. The Pope said, first I held up three fingers to represent the Holy Trinity, God in three persons, but he responded by holding up one finger to remind me that God is still one God. Then I waved my finger around my head to show him that God was everywhere around us, but he responded by pointing to the ground to show that God was also right here with us. Next, I pulled out the wine and the bread to show that through the sacrament of Holy Communion, God forgives us of our sins. But he pulled out an apple to remind me that because of original sin, our sinfulness will always persist. He had beaten me at every move, and I could not continue. Meanwhile, over in the Jewish community, the Jews had gathered to ask the rabbi how he had won. I have no idea, said the rabbi. First, he said to me that we had three days to get out of Italy, so I gave him the finger. <laughs> 
Then he tells me that the whole country would be cleared of Jews, and I said to him that we're staying right here. What happened next? Someone yelled out from the crowd. Who knows, said the rabbi. He took out his lunch, so I took out mine. Today we are talking about the sacrament of Holy Communion, also known as the Lord's Supper, sometimes known as the Eucharist, or as one of our little ones here in the church referred to it a few years ago, much to his mother's dismay, snack time. I think that's actually a beautiful way of thinking of it for someone so young, because snack time for a child is something so unquestionably good it's exciting. It's something you look forward to that you get to do with your friends or with your family. It is, of course, not a complete understanding of communion, but who among us has a complete understanding of communion? And in any case, it's a great start. Last week and the week before that, we talked about baptism, which is the other sacrament that was recognized by the Presbyterian Church. And we learned that baptism has its roots and its origins in the ancient Jewish faith and practice and in the scriptures of the Old Testament. In much the same way, communion, which we'll be talking about for this week and next week, communion, the Lord's Supper, is also a continuation and a repurposing of an ancient Jewish tradition and ritual, and that is the Feast of Passover, where Jewish people sit down at a table together and remember how God delivered them from slavery in the land of Egypt. In fact, Jesus himself, when he sits down with his disciples for the Last Supper, which is where our scripture passage in Corinthians comes from, Jesus breaks bread and pours out wine for them, and when he urges them to do these things in remembrance of him, they're celebrating Passover. That was their intent when they gathered. It was on the day of the Feast of Passover, and that's actually what today we're doing. When we repurpose this in our Christian worldview, um, instead of it being about God bringing us out of the land, slavery in the land of Egypt, it's about God offering Jesus as the sacrificial lamb and Jesus being the deliverer of us out of the slavery of sin and death. Now next week, I think Craig Field is going to talk to you a little bit more about the Last Supper, and about the theology of communion. But today, I just want to tell you a story. I want to share with you how and why this sacrament became important to me, because it wasn't always that way. I grew up in the church, taking communion once a month, pretty regularly, and not really thinking much about it at all. Actually, if I did think about it, it was that I, I thought it was kind of silly. A shot glass full of grape juice and a tiny piece of something that resembles styrofoam more than it resembles bread. And that didn't seem like much of a supper to me, or sometimes as it's called, the Eucharistic feast. And then as I got older and I started hearing about the meaning or the under theological understanding of communion, there were all of these arguments about it and those also seemed kind of silly to me at the time. On one hand, all of the Roman Catholics that I knew said that when the priest rings the little bells, that the bread and wine actually become at the molecular level the literal body and blood, the flesh and blood of Jesus himself, and that seemed at the time to me kind of gross, or if you'll pardon the pun, hard to swallow. On the other hand, all of the Baptists that I knew said that, no, it's not really a sacrament. It's nothing sacred. That's what sacrament means, something that's sacred. It's just a memorial. It's just a way to remember Jesus and nothing more. And that seemed quaint, but pointless. I mean, why not remember Jesus by actually having a real supper like he did with his disciples? Or better yet, if we're trying to remember Jesus, why not remembering him by doing the things he did so often in life, like, you know, taking care of poor people and outcasts, or, this is another favorite thing that Jesus did, challenging meaningless and empty, hollow religious rituals instead of creating a new one. 
And so for a long time, communion was pretty meaningless for me. Until one day, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America told me that I could not participate in communion. Some background to that statement. In 2010, when I was a graduate student at Princeton Theological Seminary, I started, along with several other forward-thinking, technologically savvy people across the globe, I started an online church in a virtual reality world, and we called it the First Presbyterian Church of Second Life. Now, for those who don't remember Second Life or haven't seen the Saturday Night Live sketches mocking Second Life, it was one of the very first virtual reality applications for the internet, and it allowed people to meet and gather together, not just online in a two-dimensional kind of way like Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, but in a three-dimensional, more graphic, video game-like interface that attempted to simulate or represent as best as possible the real world. And it wasn't a video game, even though it kind of looked like one. There were no rules, no objectives, no points. There was simply the space and the freedom to build and create things, communities and experiences among them. So a lot of us thought, why not build a Presbyterian church? And that's what we did. We acquired land or virtual space in Second Life. We built a sanctuary, a virtual sanctuary, a virtual education wing, a virtual conference center, even a little virtual conference shop for avatars to gather in. And, uh, and people did. People came from in the early days all around the world, and it kind of grew into a, a neat thing, um, got a lot of attention and the excitement of this is something new. And so we started having worship services where we would preach, we would do Bible study together, we would sing songs and do all of the things that you usually do in a worship service. And of course, as I said, we began calling ourselves the First Presbyterian Church of Second Life. Well, as it turns out, Presbyterians have some pretty strongly held long-standing beliefs about what it means to be a real church and how you get to be one of those. According to the Scots Confession, which is one of our oldest creeds in the denomination, there are three criteria by which something may be identified as a true church. These are the three criteria. That the word of God is truly preached and heard that the sacraments are rightly or correctly administered, and that church discipline is enforced. That last one was pretty important in the 16th century in early Scotland because they were a pretty unruly bunch. So church discipline enforced. Now, those three criteria, of those three, preaching the word of God is actually pretty easy online and in virtual reality. You can preach into a microphone, and people can hear you through the speakers of their computers. Church discipline, surprisingly, is pretty easy, too. When someone shows up to your worship service online for the purpose of heckling you or disrupting things, you just click a button to eject them from the room. It's that simple. But the sacraments, and remember, in the Presbyterian Church, there are two. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. How do you do those things in a three-dimensional online virtual world? Now, for those of us who have lived through the year 2020, that seems easy and obvious because just about every church in the world did some kind of online something or another, including communion last year because of COVID-19. But just 10 years ago, in 2010, if you had asked the most prominent theologians in the world of any tradition, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, doesn't matter. If you would ask them, is it possible to do the sacraments online? The answer would have been a universal, unequivocal, no, it's not possible. Because it's not real if you don't eat real bread and drink real wine together in the presence of real people all gathered in the same room physically the way Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. 
And so our online virtual reality church was told over and over again, you're not a real Presbyterian church. And by the way, don't even try to do the sacraments because you'd break so many rules that we might have to step in and do something about it. Dun, dun, dun. And that is pretty much the exact moment when communion and the Lord's Supper became critically important to me. I knew instinctively that these people that I was gathering with each week around the world were real people with real challenges, real hopes, real dreams, real needs. And I knew that the fellowship that we shared was real. I knew that the Spirit of God moving in our midst when we studied the scriptures together, when we sang songs together, was real. I knew that the way we loved each other and helped each other and encouraged each other was real. But we weren't a real church because we couldn't do communion together. And so I decided that communion was pretty important. We did a lot of research. We had a lot of Bible studies. We had a lot of conversations about the theology of communion. We read books written about communion uh, in modern day and 500 years ago. Um, I wrote and published an academic article in the Princeton Theological Review making an academic case for the theological underpinnings of virtual online sacraments. I spoke at conferences across the country, and I publicly debated with other theologians over this issue. Our virtual church was featured with some controversy in the magazine Presbyterians Today, and we brought our case all the way to the Office of Theology and Worship for the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. Eventually, and I think somewhat begrudgingly, those in the highest offices of our national denomination relented and acknowledged that under a very obscure clause in our Constitution, if we could find an actual brick-and-mortar Presbyterian church to authorize its pastor to officiate at communion in an online service, then we were good to go. By that time, I had graduated from seminary. I had been ordained and installed as the pastor of First Presbyterian Church of El Paso, Texas. In 2013, the elders of this congregation authorized me to do exactly that, and I became, as far as I know, the very first Presbyterian pastor ever to administer the sacrament of communion to an online worshiping community. And that's eight years before all the other Presbyterian pastors started doing it. It seems almost silly now, but you can't even imagine how deeply meaningful and moving that first communion was for us and for me when it finally happened, when we finally got to sit down in our virtual world across the table from one another, something that we had not been allowed to do for almost four years as we had been meeting together on a weekly basis. And in that moment, all of the theological arguments and debates, which usually just kind of made me mad, faded into obscurity. And we were simply a group of faithful Christians spread out across the world, but somehow one in body and spirit, just like Paul talks about in Corinthians, through this one bread and this one cup. And we were doing that thing that Jesus told us to do 2,000 years ago, doing what Christians have done for all of those years in some pretty trying circumstances and in some pretty creative ways, but always doing the best they can with the resources and the people that have been gathered around that table. I am still a part of that community. It's my other church. We still meet every Sunday night in the virtual world of Second Life, which, contrary to popular belief, is still around, is still going, and just as strange and weird as ever. And we take communion together on a quarterly basis, thanks to the consent and the cooperation of this congregation. So thank you for that. Last year, when the world turned upside down and churches could 
not meet in person. It was cathartic and a little bit bittersweet for those of us in the First Presbyterian Church of Second Life to watch just how quickly the entire Christian world decided, hey, online communion is not only acceptable, it might be a really good idea given the circumstances. And ironically for me, maybe this is just evidence that I've always been a contrarian at heart, as someone who had been doing online communion already for about eight years during the pandemic, I actually really came to appreciate and miss and long for this offline style of communion in person in a way that I wouldn't have imagined myself doing when I was strongly making the case for something completely different. Maybe that means that I have come around full circle. Or maybe, and this is something I think God does with all of us in our spiritual journeys, maybe God just continues to lead me in a fuller and more and more complete but never quite complete understanding of all the amazing and unexpected ways in which he can move and work and operate through this sacrament. For those watching from the outside, maybe it is just lunch. For children, maybe it is snack time. For some, it's a remembrance, and for others, it's the literal body and blood of Christ. For Presbyterians, it is still a defining aspect of what it means to be a church. And for me, well, it's not something silly anymore. It's something hard fought for and something that keeps growing and evolving in my spiritual understanding. It's bread and it's wine, but it's also a mystery and something sacred, a sacred promise. It's a gathering in whatever way gathering looks like these days. It's a gathering of people who share a common heritage and a common future and a common purpose together. Somewhere, I believe, in the midst of all of these things, or however you understand, however you describe what's going on in the Lord's Supper, somewhere in the midst of all of those things, I believe that Jesus himself is really, actually, present, saying, come to my table. Whatever reason it is that brought you here, you are welcome in this place. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, we love our rituals. Sometimes we invest too much into them, and sometimes we just don't really think about them much at all. But we know that you walk with us on the journey of a lifetime, opening our eyes and deepening our understanding of things that have connected us to Christians and people of faith in the past. Walk with us these days. Help us to understand the sacrifice that you made for us. Help us to understand the importance of community, of gathering together around a shared meal, whatever that looks like, God. And most of all, let this be an experience that draws us not only closer to you, but closer to each other and to the world you have called us to serve. We pray all of these things just as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.